Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services, with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. As we debrief and decompress from 2015, what were the lessons learned? How will the gravitational pull of events like this year's Emanuel Church tragedy in the Low Country, or the emotionally charged debate around immigration, or the interest rate in waiting increase, et cetera, et cetera. How will these bend the arc of our business and our policy debates going forward in 2016? Happy New Year, happy holidays, and welcome to the most widely watched and the longest running dialogue on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and we host our four resident economists for this year in review. And it all starts now. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, an economic year in review, featuring Frank Hefner of the College of Charleston, Doug Woodward from the University of South Carolina, John Connaughton of UNC Charlotte, and Perry Davis, from Appalachian State University. Now, here's Chris Williams. Hello, welcome to our program. This has got to be, and I know I say this every year, guys, so thank you for uh, just putting up with me and, and, and uh, about this, but this is one of my favorite dialogues, just simply because it's always unscripted, mm -hmm. and you all are so disrespectful to one another. I'm just glad to have a, a front seat to, to all of this. Well, putting up with you is the price we pay. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> my, my case in point. Yes. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Hefner. Gentlemen, uh, welcome back. Happy New Year. Good to be uh, here. Glad to have you here. Happy hard holidays. to believe it's been a whole year. It is hard to mm -hmm. believe. Um, so, thank you, Frank, for that yep. segue. What surprised you most about 2015? Well, for me, I, last year we were sitting here at the table talking about $60 oil, mm -hmm. and now it's below $40. And I don't think anybody expected, I, I think most of us expected it to remain in the 60, 50 to 60 range for most of the year. But I don't think anybody thought that by the end of the year it'd be below $40 and still falling. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's, for me, that's the biggest surprise. And it has obviously been a big factor in terms of what we saw uh, for growth in, in 2015. Um, this, these oil prices being this low has really stimulated a lot of consumer demand and also a lot of business investment. Yeah, I want to save that. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I want to answer this on a personal note. I spent a lot of um, 2015 in California on sabbatical in the Bay Area. And what surprised me is uh, how much I liked being back in Carolina when I got back here. Um, I mean, it's crazy out there, the crisis of unaffor you know, affordability of housing, even though the jobs are booming. It just seems like we have a, a much more stable economy here. Mm -hmm. um, and on that note, while I was out there, it was just wonderful news to hear that Volvo opened a plant in mm -hmm. South Carolina. And I, mm -hmm. I guess I didn't see that coming, but it really strengthens our auto cluster in, in the state, and uh, it bodes well for the future. Mm -hmm. Harry, what do you think? Energy prices going through 50 bucks a barrel. That, that really did surprise mm -hmm. me entirely. And the fact that they're, gonna, they're staying under 40 and perhaps going to go even lower, that's, that's a big surprise. Another surprise for North Carolina was the dramatic growth in apartment building in, the, in Charlotte and Raleigh. I mean, that's been huge this year for the economy. Yeah. Millennials are going to all live downtown and rent. Mm -hmm. And w while we sort of saw that coming, the extent to which that's happening, I think, is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. happening in We're Columbia. seeing that in Charleston also in terms of the apartment building boom. Um, the oil price issue, yes, we talk about that on our forecast one. But I, I do have a – I'm surprised that it hasn't created the boom that typically low oil prices create. 
And, and I think that's just because the economy's been just kind of mucking along for a while. Growing nicely, but mm -hmm. typically when you had oil spikes that went down a lot, you got a big burst. We haven't seen that. Uh, we haven't seen, and we've seen some negatives on it, especially in the oil patch area in terms of employment, mm -hmm. uh, stock market issues in terms of oil stocks and uh, other stocks. So I, I, I think it's, it's, there's a other side to it. And there's a, there's a difference in this uh, deduction in oil, and that is uh, this is mostly a supply side rather than a de demand side issue. And so we've got a huge supply of oil right now worldwide. Mm -hmm. And who would have thunk that last year, two years ago, three years ago? Uh, so that that is amazing. So but on that also note, in terms of South Carolina, Volvo, clearly. But uh, the other ones are the two um, uh, kind of disasters that took place in Charleston. One is, and, and Columbia with the weather. Very much. Uh, very much so. Who would have thunk that you need flood insurance in Columbia? <laughs> you know, and that 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 was a sure. That was a very different thing. Yeah. And then, of course, the uh, Mother Manual mm -hmm. uh, crisis and the Walter Scott uh, police shooting mm -hmm. issue. Those were totally unexpected and are big issues. I think. You know, you know, and I, d I don't want to minimize that. We're going to come back to the okay. social issues mm -hmm. that surprised a lot of people in the right. Carolinas. I want to come back to the price of energy, John. Anyone. Is, is there a downside for having falling and cheaper and cheaper energy besides the industry itself? Beside the industry, I, I really don't see it. Um, you know, there, there, there's probably an issue as it relates to alternative fuels and carbon going forward that cheaper energy exacerbates. It yeah. makes it much more difficult for alternative uh, sources of energy to be developed without subsidies and government help. And as a result, it's probably going to put a dent in those um, but you do have a lot of government regulations out there that are pushing uh, miles per gallon and carbon emission issues for cars and for industry. Mm -hmm. uh, we've recently had the big Paris conference, which should e escalate that. So there'll be a lot of government regulation that'll help keep that on track, but there won't be the economic price factors driving alternative energy uh, solutions uh, for quite some time mm -hmm. because of this incredibly cheap oil. And, the, and essentially, it's not just cheap, it's also is, is Frank was saying, this glut of oil almost. It, it, yeah. You could go back 10 or 15 years and you could count on your hands and feet the n amount of known reserves at current usage rates. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking about not decades of it, but centuries of known reserves mm -hmm. at current usage rates. So, um, you know, the whole picture has changed dramatically just in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just add to that and say there's another downside, and that's the overall tendency towards deflation, which I don't think we as economists <coughs> are prepared for, including the economists at the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, we have commodity deflation generally, but... You mean prepared for mentally or prepared for with, with a our set models of tools? Or just, or set of tools. I mean, yeah. you have already in Europe negative interest rates. I mean, a lot of bizarre things are happening that I don't think we fully understand the consequences of. I think oil prices decline is just a part of this larger trend that yeah. I think is, is going to continue for uh, many years to come. And just I jumping think in on that. What we're going to see also is that on the consumer side, because of a lot of the initiatives in the last 10, 15 years, the effect of low oil prices, I don't think is filtering into consumer spending as much as it used to because people are not, dri mm. they're driving better cars. And it's not like the price of gasoline dropped a lot. So I did, what, five more trips this year? Yeah. I just spent you're a little bit less, less money. I'm, you know, I'm driving less and I'm using less oil because of the car mm -hmm. situation. So I, I don't see that we're going to get that positive spin off on the consumer side. Yeah, John and then Harry. Jim. Well, I was just going to say what Doug was mentioning about in terms of deflation. We actually saw an example of that this year because of the decline in oil prices. It kept overall inflation rate to zero for the year. And Social Security benefits beneficiaries got no raise this year for the first time in quite a while. So and that was a shock to them. They didn't uh, yeah. know that could happen. Yeah, and so yeah, there are some negative side side effects of this this environment. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a, de a global deflation in commodity prices. Doesn't matter what commodity it is, whether it's oil or copper, gold. Doesn't matter. They're all going down. In my opinion, that's good for some countries and really bad for others. I mean, if you're a commodity country like Australia, Canada. Russia, you got real problems. But for other countries, the United States, we, I think we overall will benefit from those lower energy prices in the long run. Apparently the consumers are not spending it. They are paying down debt and saving it, but that will mm -hmm. change as we go along. I mean, we've gotten a thousand dollar tax-free gift just in a year from the decline in prices at the pump. Mm -hmm. That money will eventually show up in spending. Do you, do you think the energy, let's take this to a different level. Everyone thought, a lot of people thought at least, that 2015 was going to be the year of some real transportation 
uh, uh, build out and development, and I'm talking about roads, I'm talking about transit plans and some of the urban cores. South Carolina and North Carolina, both the General Assemblies said that that was going to be job one. Right. It was in North Carolina to a, uh, to a decent degree in South Carolina, not so much. But my point is not to not have you defend that, Doug, but does, the, 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 does this calculus of low energy change kind of the arc of what's going to happen and what needs to happen in transit and transportation? Well, I'll tell you one reason. They could raise the gas tax and nobody hardly notice. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, this is the year to do it. Uh, well, 2015, 2016, you know, soon. Because they get covered for falling prices? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. I, I think we, we can definitely afford to do it and we need to do it. Well, Congress passed the highway out. bill. The mm -hmm. president signed it. No funding. Wasn't even mentioned in the bill. Why are we not raising the gas tax? I mean, there's no better time in history to be doing it right now. So answer that question here. To pay for the paper. Why aren't we? Because politicians have not got the guts to do it. Yeah. They actually think the American people are stupid to some extent, that we really are all opposed to increasing taxes to pay for infrastructure spending. I don't think so. I think if the politicians would raise the gas tax, I don't think the American people would want to throw them all out of, out of office. I think they would support that. We know we need infrastructure. I mean, you ask any audience, and they will all tell you we need infrastructure spending in this country, Was North there any, Carolina. Is there any surprise that South Carolina did not have more of a, a progressive plan around infrastructure and transit and, and roads? Wait a minute, progressive? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, progressive was a, well, <laughs> yes, was a small That, that would have been piece. a big surprise. Yeah. Uh, no, I think the, one of the problems, of course, with our gas tax is that it's not a percentage, which is a good thing when gas prices drop. But in a lot of states, it is a percentage. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, lowering gas prices does hurt their infrastructure funding. In our case, raising it right now would actually be a very smart move to do. But whether that'll happen, no. And, and it's not a surprise. But whether, whether you They're debating right now. I'm sorry. They're debating yeah. using the budget surplus for that. But, whether you but then we got hit with a flood, so they got money that they got to spend on that. Let's take a look at what North Carolina yeah. did in, in, to Harry's, to Harry's yeah. point. Mm -hmm. They did smoke and mirror trick on it. They're actually going to raise the trust fund in, in, in North Carolina. But they did it by lowering the gas tax right. and increasing fees. So for a couple of examples, if after January 1st you buy a car, mm -hmm. you're going to get hit with a 4% sales tax instead of the current 3% sales tax. Uh, registration, uh, num uh, uh, the, the moment you pay for your registration every year is going to go up yep. as well. That's up to you. Secondly, North Carolina also is going to have a bond issue uh, this, this coming year uh, that's going to go for a, predominantly infrastructure related. So there'll be some highway money and then there'll be money for university system for some buildings and stuff, uh, community colleges, etc. So there'll be, a, there'll be another bond referendum. It won't be the size of the six billion dollar referendum that was how many years ago Harry about about six or seven yeah, eight? seven or eight years but yeah. it'll be two plus billion it'll be two plus yeah. billion um, and so you know on the one hand the state of North Carolina has addressed this issue slightly okay mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time they also pulled back the funding potential for uh, mass transit in the Raleigh Durham area mm -hmm. uh, will, will will there be movement though in transportation I think I guess so. that's the let, me, let me just say this because there are business leaders in the Carolinas exactly. that are telling our legislators that mm -hmm. they won't invest any longer unless they do something significantly with infrastructure. They hear that, they know that. I think that is going to finally uh, get some resonance, uh, and at least in, in South Carolina. Uh, and again, we can afford to do it. And also, they have great examples where it works. We built the inland port that connects Charleston mm -hmm. now to the upstate. It's paid off dividends. They can look at that and say, we get a return on this. Why aren't we doing it? Yeah. Let, let's, let's, take, let's go from energy now. Let's go to overall growth. 2016, is there going to be growth? Will there be gross state product increase? And what, what does that look like? In North Carolina? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think we will grow a little bit quicker in 2016 than in 2015. 2015 was a good year for North Carolina. We grew a little faster than the national economy. We had been growing slower. Our unemployment rate continues to be stubbornly high. It, we need to get it down for, because for decades, North Carolina had a lower unemployment rate than the national average, and we continue to have one that's higher. So that's got to change. There's something different about the economy right now than has been mm -hmm. so in previous recoveries. Productivity growth is almost non-existent. Now, I'm talking about North Carolina. I'm talking about the nation. It's 1%, about 1%. If you look at the post-World War II period, it's, the average is 25 to 3. So all we're getting in terms of productivity growth is 1%. You need productivity growth for the middle class and for people at the bottom of the economic ladder. That, they're the ones who are helped tremendously with productivity growth, and we don't have it.
So almost exactly 12 months ago, hold on, Frank, I know you want to jump in. I'll give you a chance. Uh, almost exactly 12 months ago, John, you sat here and said, gosh, 2015 is going to be a blowout. We're going to do incredible. I'm assuming you were talking about GDP or gross state product. That's correct. So Harry said it was good last year. How do you read it? It, it, it's it's good. It's been good this year, the 2015. Uh, our estimate is that when all the numbers are in, they're not all in yet. Probably about 2.9 percent. Now that doesn't sound like a lot because everybody and all the politicians are talking about wanting four or five percent growth in GDP. Let's be clear about that. That's not going to happen. As Harry started mm -hmm. mentioning about productivity, but there's also in addition to that, there's a demographic issue. The days of four percent economic growth at the federal level and state level are gone. And so when you look at a 2.9% growth in North Carolina, given the current demographic and uh, structural si situation, that's a really, really good growth year. Probably when it's all said and done, 90,000 jobs this year. Um, those are good numbers following what we had in, in 2014. So, yeah, this has been a really good year for North Carolina. What about South Carolina? Well, I was going to say about the uh, GDP. I just can't release the third quarter for the na nation was 3.8 percent, which was a little bit higher than anticipated. And that makes up for the miserable second quarter also. So on the year average, I don't think we're going to get very much out of it. The problem with the 1 percent uh, growth in productivity, though, is what that does to wages. And, and that's been a that's been a, a problem for the nation yeah. and for the uh, states. Mm -hmm. South Carolina has been doing fairly well in terms of job growth, uh, and we you know everything. Would you say respectable? I think very respectable. In uh, addition to respectable. that, wage and salary growth finally mm -hmm. we're right. seeing a pickup in personal income. Mm -hmm. When people have more income, they're going to spend it, and that just cycle is going to continue. We're in a virtuous cycle. Right. Um, I was optimistic last year, like uh, John was at this mm -hmm. time. Uh, I think we had a really good year in South Carolina, uh, as good as we could expect under the conditions, the right. demographics, and everything. Uh, was was just it was a great year. You know, people the unemployment gonna, rate though is the bugaboo, and you yeah. know, I think that's the it's problem. It's still sticky in the two it's, states. It's still yeah. sticky. Yeah. Nationally, but, it's not. Yeah, but it, it's just it's a question. It's it's always that constant battle between who's in the labor force and who's <clears> not in the labor yeah. force, and why they're not. So we we could have a really booming economy with a stuck unemployment rate. So I'm not too sure that's our best measure anymore. Well, well, but you know, this whole idea that, John, and this is kind of a side dialogue we were having about, and you said, well, it's a new norm. Well, well we've all used that term so much, John. Why is this a new norm? Okay, let me first of all respond to what Frank said about the unemployment rate. Yeah. Um, there are two things that can cause the unemployment rate, a bad sure. economy mm -hmm. and net in migration because people think the economy here is really good. Right. And what we've been seeing in North Carolina, at least, has been that the, the the labor force has been growing right. yeah. uh, as a result of, of net in migration, and that's that's really been the crux of our unemployment rate stickiness, if you yeah. will, mm -hmm. hanging at about a half a percent above the U.S. level for most of this year. Because at the beginning of the year, we the, North Carolina was below the U.S. rate, and that was sending signals out of, and about what what's going on in the state. We had a sluggish first half of the year, so despite the fact that the unemployment rate was low, and people said, "Hey, this is a good place to go get a job." So um, it's the job growth rate yeah. that we really need. Yes, we look at that. We had a good job growth rate last year, yes. two and a half yeah. percent. We're mm -hmm. expecting that will continue. Okay, yeah. how about how about this idea about a new norm? Okay. That two percent, one percent. That's yeah. going to be it, what it, it's going to it, be. This piggybacks on, on what Harry brought up about productivity. Uh, I've got this scary chart I do when I go out to, to speak to people, and I and I look at. <laughs> has your picture on it? Yeah, it has my <laughs> picture on it. Well, that's down on the side. It's, <laughs> that's the second scary part of the graph, but it does the. Uh, it, it it looks at labor force growth and productivity growth side by side for the decades back to the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and so on, and then for the last five years. And the graph goes along like this, boom, 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 boom. As Harry said, in the 2%, 2.5% 2 range right. for productivity growth, 1, 1.5% 1 range for labor growth. But by the way, if you add those two things together, you get potential GDP growth. It really is that simple, mm -hmm. okay? And, um, then, and then all of a sudden, the last five years, both of those numbers go down. Productivity growth for the last five years has been about three quarters mm -hmm. of a percent on average for those five years. Mm -hmm. Labor force growth has been about a quarter percent, yes, per year. Those are historically low numbers. You put 0.25 and 0.75 together, and Bill Clinton can do the arithmetic here. It comes out to 1 percent. And that's really kind of what you can expect to get in terms of potential GDP growth. Now, we've had the gap that we can close, which has led to these 2 and 3 percent growth rates that we've seen because we have excess resources to close that gap. But we are really right now very, very close to potential GDP. And, without, and, and the demographics aren't going to change. I mean, the bottom line here is that the age groups that are now entering retirement 
are followed by groups in 16 and 19 year old that are about the same size or smaller. So to, uh, not to shortcut you, but to get to the point, you say it's demographics that's changing the calculus for GDP growth. That's the, yeah. that's okay. the, big, inch, that's the okay. big elephant in Let's, the room. But as Harry said, productivity is the only way out of this. Okay, so and it, weighed in we, on this. We have I will say minutes. I agree with the demographics, uh, but I don't agree with the productivity. I think we're looking in the rear view mirror. We're going to see accelerating technology, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence. They're sweeping across every industry. It's just happening now. It's in Boeing. It's in BMW. They're going to drive productivity growth like you've never seen in the next 10 years. And I think we're going to have a hard time mm -hmm. figuring out how to employ people, right. uh, yet we're going to create all this output. Okay. Well, That's I, going to be I the problem. You're, I yes. hope you're right. I'm, I'm not seeing it, though, in terms of business's ability or, or willingness, excuse me, not ability, a willingness to invest in plant and equipment and workers. It's not happening. I mean, that, that has to happen to have productivity growth. Mm -hmm. Companies are sitting on the cash. Mm -hmm. Companies are, taking, are borrowing money at record levels, taking the money and buying back their own stock to, to take care of their stockholders, their shareholders. Mm -hmm. They're not investing in plant and equipment. Business investment is very low, historically low. Mm -hmm. And until that changes, you're not going to see much of a change in productivity. Mm -hmm. It can't happen. Yeah. I have to agree with that. And I think that, that feeds into uh, some of the other issues we were talking about earlier, and that is, uh, what are they doing with all of this cash? And as mm -hmm. you alluded, they're buying stock buyouts and stuff like that. But the other thing is... And they're at doing, record levels. They're, uh, and, and mergers. Mm -hmm. So companies are growing not by producing more necessarily, but just by growing into bigger companies. Okay, so that brings up in about yeah. four minutes now, that brings up a question we were also talking before we rolled mm -hmm. here. Um, Sycamore Partners, venture, uh, venture capital firm, pri I'm sorry, private equity firm just uh, completed the purchase of mm -hmm. Belk after 120 plus years under family ownership. Harris Teeter was bought out by Kroger, Family Dollar, uh, went with Dollar Tree. Uh, Wachovia has gone away for another reason. Piedmont Natural Gas has been purchased by Duke Energy, and the list goes on. General Parts has been acquired up in the triangle. So. What is that? Is it related to what we're talking about here? Are these productivity moves? Are these cost uh, I think containment? it has what to do this? with cost savings, trying to find some way to drive down cost because the world is flat. You can't raise prices because somebody else somewhere else will produce it at a lower cost and sell it at a lower price. And so the, the world being flat has driven everybody to look at cost. It's true in banking, mm -hmm. an area that I cover very closely. Every bank's trying to figure out some way to cut costs, which is why banks are merging and acquiring each other as hard as they can go. 72 in the third quarter. I mean, it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. There, it's a cost drive, of course, but the, the, they, we go through these phases in the American economy also where uh, there's an expected economies of scale that doesn't always materialize, and then, then we have the divestitures later. But right now, I agree with you, the push is cost cutting, and the other push is what do we do with all this cash? And that's a little scary because it's not, oh, we have great potential in our industry. Let's invest in new assembly lines. Instead, it's let's buy out the competitor. There's, there's also a yeah. pent-up demand issue. Yes. I mean, there hasn't been a lot of activity in the three or four mm -hmm. years coming out of the, the recession in 10, 11, and 12, and 13. So we're starting to do some catch-up on that. But a number of the ones that you mentioned th that are these are these local. Companies. Yeah, the yeah, number of companies that you mentioned locally. Uh, also are, are, are sort of, uh, they, were, they were privately held companies, right. some very tightly ha privately held companies, and obviously not Wachovia, but. Well, to some degree, I mean, Harris Teeter was part of American and Ephraim and, and, and yeah. so on and so forth. But, you know, it was, a, it was a sense of being able to cash out of these things for stocks that are not easily tradable. Yeah. And so I think that was part of what's driving some of the, some of the stuff here. Uh, closing thoughts, Doug? Uh, I just add to that. I mean, again, I'll come back to this narrative of deflation. With loss of pricing power, these companies, they've got to find cost savings. Mm, right. that's, that's the only way they're going to survive. So it doesn't surprise me yeah. you're going to see this M&A activity. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you uh, once again for being on our program. Uh, hang around because we, uh, uh, you know, we're going to do another program, and we'd like you to be part of that as well, except this time we look ahead at, oh, 2016. Uh, any opinions about that? Or do you want to save it for later? Let's yeah, just unbelievably <laughs> quiet. All it's going to be the best year ever. Best year ever? No, don't again? quote me on that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Too much uh, uncertainty. Guys, thank you. Thanks for staying there. John, always nice to see you. Uh, Doug, thanks for uh, coming up from the capital city. Harry, down from the mountain, thanks as always. Glad me. to have you. Thank and Frank from Charleston. We love Charleston. Glad to have you here. Thank too. you.
Uh, thank you for being on our program. Uh, this has been a look back. What happened in 2015? What were those things? We didn't even talk about the social and the more human element of 2015. We will talk about that on our next program. We hope you stay around for that. If you have questions or comments, carolinabusinessreview.org. We'd love to hear from you. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.